you ever done any Java EE, you know the sentiment. That there's a lot, a lot of boilerplate that you have to do to do the simplest thing. It's a very powerful framework, but it's not very programmer friendly. That you just have to, to as a problem, you just have to write a lot of very boring code to, uh, uh, in order to get going. They've simplified that to a good degree. E5 and E6 are much better, but still, it's not an easy, uh, <coughs> it's not as easy as it should be. And the problem is Java. Java is not malleable enough, it's not rich enough to uh, make you kick out the boilerplate. Other languages are, and we're going to see some, some of those. So <coughs> Java is not what's called the end of history. Um, people really thought for a while that it would be. If you go back 10 years ago, there was a great deal of complacency. People kind of felt that they had arrived. Maybe Java wasn't perfect, but it was so near per to perfection that people just kind of didn't, weren't that interested in programming languages anymore. And uh, they, uh, <coughs> they thought it had arrived. Um, the End of History is uh, the title of a, a well-known book um, that, that came out 10, 15 years ago where this, this professor Francis Fukuyama argued that Western civilization and the capitalist system has dominated the world. And that, that was going to be the, 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 the point to which everything would converge, everything would look like America. And as we now know, of course, history has marched on and uh, we, this country may well be left behind and something else may, may happen. So one shouldn't count on the end of history. Um, and so <coughs> the other thing that we now notice is that the Java story for concurrency is not great. Java concurrency was invented when, uh, well before people were concerned about multi-core, when the, the model for concurrency was lots of users for short blips of time hitting a web server. And that's an important aspect of concurrency, but it's not the only thing. And the other thing that, of course, is sad about Java uh, is that client deployment is not working as well as it should. If you look at your desktop, how many Java apps do you actually run? Like, you and I run one, Eclipse. But what else? And this for, you know, what was supposed to you know, push Microsoft off the desktop, so that's kind of sad. And there was... There were many technical reasons why why this didn't really work out. And then operating systems have been enhanced and the library is kind of falling behind. And part of that was, of course, the history that Java was then maintained by Sun Microsystems and Sun ran out of steam. And then it took Oracle for uh, a long time to, to pick it up. And who knows what's happening now. But now there's a very conservative evolution of Java. Uh, you've probably noticed Java 7 came out a few weeks ago. And what's new in Java 7? What is the most exciting thing that Java 7 has to offer for the masses? Yeah. Name one feature in Java 7. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Right, come on the internet. So here you find a complete list of features, and uh, let's see if someone blogged about it. Here we have a blog. Someone says, okay. "Ant, what does he want to point out as the most exciting feature? Strings and switch. Ladies and gentlemen, you can now use strings in a switch statement. That is not what I would call." rapid advance in language technology, right? So, and that is truly, that is the most exciting feature in Java 7. Um, so, <coughs> uh, so Java is, is kind of uh, progressing at a, at a very slow pace. And what you have in, um, is uh, an explosion of new and interesting languages. So like, uh, in the slide I say the Cambrian explosion, um, if you remember your biology class, uh, a long time ago, and I don't remember when, um, in the history of the Earth, there was this phase where out of a sudden a, a huge number of life forms evolved, very strange looking creatures, and then they, you know, a few hundred million years later, vanished again before the dinosaurs ever roamed the Earth. But you had like this period where out of a sudden a huge, huge new number of creatures uh, uh, sprang up in a very short amount of time. So we have that in languages. I have a list of languages that you might, might see. And so, um, I look at the site dzone.com several times a week because it's kind of a good aggregator site for blogs that people write 
about what, what interests them in programming. And uh, so these are regular old programmers, uh, you know, not programming language fanatics, but people who, you know, who code for a living. You can kind of see what, uh, what ails them. Here we have something about uh, uh, CSS3, GitHub, um, a bunch of JavaScript libraries for, for because they're all web designers, um, something Java E6 and NetBeans. Um, Griffon is something that uses Groovy as a, as a library. Groovy is programming language. Um, and as you go through here, here someone talks about uh, something to do with Python. Um, every week you can see a dozen languages or so uh, mentioned. Um, here's someone tired of getters and setters and has a Java add-on. Um, here's a, now we're going to have 20 articles about Steve Jobs. Uh, C sharp. And so uh, when you look at the kind of languages that are, that are mentioned there, you see a lot of Ruby and Groovy, uh, the, the P's, Python, PHP, and Perl, um, JavaScript, uh, quite a lot of that now. Um, Java FX, I guess, there was a flurry a while ago, but not so much. Flex, the same thing, those seem to be waning. Um, on, on a given week, there's going to be several Scala articles. Um, I haven't seen anything about Newspeak for a while, but Clojure kind of competes with Scala for attention by the, uh, by the in crowd. And so there are all of these different languages, and some of them are optimized for very fixed tasks. Well, you would uh, learn uh, ActionScript or Flex if you wanted to do that kind of Adobe, uh, uh, what's, what's that thing, Flash program. Um, you would learn um, PHP. OK, I have no idea why. Anyone would want to learn PHP, but people do. Um, and some of these languages aim to be the next language that you, you all should be using. Scala, for example, wants to be your next programming language. And yeah, it might be. Um, <coughs> so there is this huge interest right now that people are, are saying, what comes after Java? And no one knows. But people are trying different things. Just like a few weeks ago, um, out of two different organizations, uh, 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 groups tried to come up uh, with some proposals for language that's halfway between Java and Scala. They said Java is obviously uh, not going to cut it anymore. Scala is pretty complicated. Can we do something in between? So within weeks, two different uh, organizations proposed something, and that'll come to some fruition in the next months or so. And again, um, if, if you're in the business of selecting technology, you want to have the ability to cut through those claims pretty quickly. And that's where it really helps to have some, some knowledge of language theory. All right, so, so like I say, the challenges that are ahead here are um, concurrency. And that's, that's the biggest, biggest problem that everyone's facing, that <coughs> um, concurrency is the new normal. You're going to have to expect that the processor that you, your program runs on has more force than anyone can keep busy. And you need to figure out how to do that. Or you want to need to figure out how can I design a language so that the programmer doesn't have to figure out too much. Now, I say it would be nice to have automated concurrency, just like you have automated get garbage collection. And for some problem domains, that's actually possible. So as, a, as an example, um, when you use Java 7, one of the more interesting Java 7 features that you will never see advertised anywhere is that if you take an array and you run sort on it, it's automatically parallelized. So if your processor has more than one core, just calling sort automatically uses the this, this, this second core. And that's kind of nice, right? So um, for, for tasks like that, one can do it. Scala does has a much nicer story to tell there where not just sorting, but any kind of algorithm that you can express in a certain way is, can be automatically parallelized. And so, so that's a good thing. And then the question is, what, what if you don't have that kind of regularity? Sort is very regular. Iterating over a collection is very regular. Uh, how can you deal with those situations? We're going to look at several proposals that, that people have. And so uh, right now, of course, you can implement more uh, concurrent programs, but generally you have to, to use locks. And most students have had some, had, a, had an operating system course where you maybe did the dining philosophers or something like that, and scratched your head and said, this is all too complicated, and, and what's the point anyway? And um, so, then when, they, when uh, you get to do some professional pr uh, programming and you have to debug things with locks, then you're going to see that this is really a nasty business. It's very, very difficult to do this right. And so some better paradigm has to come up. 
And <coughs> so, so we're going to spend a fair amount of time on that. The other thing is this issue of agility, that when, when you look at a Java program, Java was purposefully designed to be easy to read. So when you, when you listen to Gosling, he will say that you know, C++ they felt was hard to read because the, the syntax was awkward and stuff. And so they've taken away features in Java so that programs would be easy to read. For example, in C++, you can overload the meaning of operators. You can say if you have two big nums, for example, A plus B should add the two big nums. In Java, you can't do that. And so the, the, uh, they took that away because they felt some programmers out there would be writing hard to read code by using overloaded operators. And, but as a result, Java is also very verbose. That the same thing that you can express in something like Ruby or Scala in uh, 10 lines will take 20 to 30 lines in Java. And now you might say, big deal. But someone has to read through those 20 or 30 lines. And it's not just that you have to read through them, that as you read through them, you have to scan and say, are these the same boring boilerplate things that I have seen a million times? Or is there a trick somewhere? Is there a wrinkle? Did they do something slightly different? And that takes some amount of time. And it's, uh, it's unproductive. There's ample research that shows that product, uh, productivity of programmers is roughly proportional to the number of lines of code that they, that they write. So every programmer can write so many lines of code per day, debug lines of code. And it doesn't much matter which language. That can be assembly or C or Scala. And so if you can cut down on the number of lines of code, that should make programmers somewhat more productive. Seems utterly unintuitive, but that's how it is. And much of it is that you know, we read more code than we write, and we need to read other people's code. And if that code is short, it's kind of faster to read. Of course, at some point, there's a tipping point. If you cram every code in, in one line with no blank space, then that's bad too. But so Java was made to be easy to read, but it turns out the repetitiveness works against it. And so people kind of, also they hate it. Um, they have to slog through all of that stuff. Eclipse helps a great deal. You know, I do half my, uh, my coding with control space. Um, but still, I have to read everything that I generate. And <coughs> then if you need to make changes, and if you have a lot of boilerplate, where you have getters and setters here, and you have some XML configuration here, and you have more getters and setters that meet, need to match the other ones, um, that usually exceeds what the refactoring tool can do because the refactoring tool knows about Java but it doesn't know about your library and your XML configuration. And so you have things that are very brittle and very hard to change. So Ruby, Ruby on Rails here really is kind of the anti-Java uh, in this case. It's very agile. Um, it puts things together that, that need to be changed together. It uh, has it, uh, this principle, uh, don't repeat yourself, the dry principle where they uh, say everything should be mentioned only in one spot. Uh, and that's the, the opposite of what happens in a big Java framework, where everything is mentioned here and here and here, and all has to be just so. Don't let, get me going with Java server faces. If I had a dollar for every time that I named something here, one way and there, another way, and then you know, it then takes five minutes for your app to come up, and then you go, duh. And um, so many five minute and duh cycles, I mean, and your day is done. So, um, and so what does it take to make a language agile? Um, Rails programmers have a high price to pay, two high prices. Number one, they have to learn Ruby. Now, Ruby is weird. You'll see. You'll, you'll see why I said that. And number two, Ruby is not strongly typed. So they're going to face a lot of errors uh, dur during uh, de uh, development that, they c that the compiler can't catch. So is there, some, is there a better way of doing it? Can you have agile in a language that's sane, that has better compile time checking? And so we'll, we'll talk about that. The other thing is that <coughs> it's, it's kind of a curse on the world that you have these little languages everywhere. You know, you, I've seen projects where you use JavaScript for, uh, of course, on, on the web page, where then some Flash components that use ActionScript for that, and then someone puts it in their mind to use Lua, whatever goes on in their mind, I don't know, but they do. And then, of course, you use Bash for some, some automation, and then they use PHP to, to write the, uh, the web pages, and then they uh, have some Java backend, and so you have all of these languages, and it makes it hard to staff because now you know someone goes on vacation, and you can't just tell the Java guy, well, why don't you deal with that Lua code? Uh, and so it's it's kind of unfortunate. Also, it means that if you are actually on your own working on such a project, you know that it takes a certain amount of time. It probably takes you know, between six months and a year to be really fluent in a language, where your fingers think the language. 
you know, at this point, I would imagine that either in Java and C++, you can program.